lecture, I'll be discussing normal periodontal anatomy on radiographs and assessment of the periodontium with radiographs. Now, before we can identify abnormal structures or tissues on radiograph, we first have to have a solid foundation in how normal appearances of the periodontium present. So first as a review, let's talk about some of the features of radiolucent versus radiopaque structures. Radiolucent structures are easily penetrated by the x-ray beam, so they appear dark gray to black on a processed film. Some of the normal structures that we see that are radiolucent would be the pulp and the periodontal ligament space. Diseased areas of the periodontium can also appear radiolucent, such as the periapical pathosis and alveolar bone loss. Radiopaque structures will resist the penetration of the x-ray beam, so they appear light gray to white on a processed film. Examples of normal radiopaque structures would include the enamel, the dentin, the alveolar bone. Other radiopaque structures um, might include pulp stones or dental restorations. Now, this might seem silly, but the way I always thought of this was like paste or glue. I would substitute radiopaque with radiopaste. Since paste is white, it helped me remember that radiopaste structures are whiter in nature. Maybe that'll help you too. When we talk about the alveolar structures, we'll be looking at two different types of bone cortical bone and cancellous bone. Cortical bone is also called compact bone and consists of layers of bone that are closely packed together. Cortical bone covers the outer surfaces of each arch. In the maxilla, the cort cortical bone is a thin shell, but in the mandible, it is much more dense. Cancellous bone is a trabecular bone, a spongy bone, which is the type of bone that makes up the alveolar bone. The alveolar bone is located between the alveolar bone proper and the plates of the cortical bone. So here we have a side view of a mandibular premolar where we can view the different types of bone. There are several types of cortical bone, but here you can see the cortical bone which covers the outer surface of the mandible as well as the alveolar bone proper, which is also compact bone. The trabecular bone or alveolar bone is between the alveolar bone proper and the cortical bone. And you'll see sometimes the words alveolar bone proper and lamina dura interchanged. Alveolar bone proper is the anatomical term and lamina dura is what we call it when we see it on a radiograph. Another example of cortical bone would be the inferior border of the mandible, which can be seen here in this panoramic image. This has quite a thick cortical bone at the mandibular border. Let's look at some normal radiographic anatomy. Showed you the anatomical anatomy, and now let's look at it radiographically. The first thing I wanna point out, I know this is a little fundamentary, but just so we can have a review, we have the enamel, which we can see is a more dense outer layer around the crown. And then underneath the enamel, we have the dentin, and then we have the pulp chamber, and we have the pulp canals that run down the tooth. Now where the enamel and the cementum meet, that is what we call the CEJ. On a radiograph, you can typically see where the enamel ends and the cementum begins. We can't really distinguish on a radiograph the difference between the dentin and the cementum because they are similar in radiopacity and the cementum is a thinner layer around the root structure. So right where the enamel and the dentin meet, or the enamel and the cementum meet there, that's where we call the CEJ. Uh, and then we have the periodontal ligament space. That's going to be a dark line that surrounds the root structure of the tooth. Because the periodontal ligaments are tissue, we can't see them on the x-ray. We can only see the space in which the periodontal ligaments are housed. Uh, and then we have the lamina dura. Remember I said sometimes alveolar bone proper and lamina dura are interchanged? So on a radiograph, we would call this dense cortical bone that surrounds the periodontal ligament space the lamina dura. The spaces in between the lamina dura of one tooth to the lamina dura of the other tooth 
is going to be trabecular bone. So that's uh, alveolar bone in between those teeth. So we call that interdental alveolar bone. And what we can't see on this radiograph is that we have a buccal or facial cortical bone and we have a lingual cortical bone. So those are things that we cannot see on the radiograph itself. Now let's talk a little bit about the alveolar crest. This is an important component of the analysis of the periodontium because early changes in this part of the anatomy can give us warning signs of periodontal disease processes. The alveolar crest is a dense compact bone which is the height of the alveolar process between two neighboring teeth. On a radiograph, we should see the dense nature of the bone compared to the trabecular bone of the interdental alveolar bone. We want the alveolar crest to be rounded or flat, and in a healthy mouth, the alveolar crest can lie up to two millimeters below the CEJ. When we evaluate the horizontal crest, we must first draw an imaginary line from the CEJ of one tooth to the CEJ of an adjacent tooth, and then we will evaluate the alveolar crest against that line. In this example, the alveolar crest is healthy, intact, and horizontally contoured. It is slightly rounded, and we can clearly see the density of the bone across the entire height of the crestal bone. With horizontal bone loss, we would see a reduction of alveolar bone height horizontally between two adjacent teeth. The imaginary line of the CEJ height compared to the line of the alveolar bone height reveals that there's about a two millimeter alveolar bone loss on tooth number 30. The alveolar bone here appears approximately four millimeters below the CEJ. And since alveolar bone height can lay up to two millimeters below the CEJ in a healthy mouth, we wouldn't say that there's a four millimeter loss here. We would say there's a two millimeter loss. It's all sort of a guesstimation. It's using your professional judgment. So just keep those things in mind when you're assessing. There's a pretty cool feature in EagleSoft that you can use to help you with this assessment. Let me show you how to do it. When we're assessing radiographs in EagleSoft, there are some tools that we can use to help us in that assessment. And eventually you won't really need these tools. You'll be able to do this just by looking at it. Um, but every now and then I like to play around with the tools myself or if I'm on the fence of is there bone loss or is there not, sometimes I'll use the tool to help me in my assessment as well. So what you can do, there's a line feature here. You can click line. And if line is not available in your toolbar, you can click under tools at the top and then you can find the line feature. And I can take and draw, instead of having an imaginary line from the CEJ to the CEJ, I can actually draw that line. So I'm going to take the line feature and draw from the CEJ of one tooth to the CEJ of the adjacent tooth. And then I'm gonna take and draw another line at the height of the alveolar crest from one tooth to the next. And I can see that these two lines are parallel. And so um, the patient um, definitely has a horizontal contour to that bone height. I can take this one step further and actually measure the distance from the CEJ to the alveolar crest. So I will take this measure tool and I will click from one line to the next, double click on that, and you can see that it is 0.84 millimeters. So less than one millimeter. And since the alveolar crest can be up to two millimeters from the CEJ, then this would be a normal bone level, alveolar crest level. Even if those lines are not there, you can still use the measure tool. You can just click from the CEJ to the alveolar crest and here again, it's 0.87 millimeters. So that is a normal alveolar crest level. Just a cool feature that you can use. It's not 100% foolproof. So take that information and use it with all of your other assessments when you are determining whether there is a bone loss evident on the x-ray or not. But in most cases, it does give us somewhat of an accurate depiction. The alveolar crest can also be healthy even if there's an angular contour. So we talked before about having a horizontal contour. Now we're talking about having an angular contour. 
When we look at this example, we may first assume that there is bone loss, but if you draw an imaginary line from the CEJ of number 20 to the CEJ of number 19, we see that there's a natural angle in the alignment of these two teeth, and therefore there's a natural angle in the alignment of the alveolar crest. The important takeaway here is that you should always draw the imaginary line between the two adjacent CEJs before assessing the alveolar crest. When there is a vertical bone loss, we see loss of the alveolar height, which is more exaggerated on one tooth compared to the adjacent tooth. In this picture, we can see that there's a significant bone loss on the distal of tooth number 29. If we draw an imaginary line from the CEJ of tooth 29 to the CEJ of tooth 30, and then we draw a line following the alveolar height, we do not have a para parallel loss of alveolar bone. It's much more exaggerated towards the distal of number 29, which indicates that there is a vertical bone loss. In this second picture, the vertical bone loss is not nearly as exaggerated, but it is still evident. Let's look at tooth numbers 30 and 31. Both of these teeth are crowned, so it's much more difficult to determine the approximate line of where the CEJ would be but we can make an educated guess when we evaluate the crowns of these teeth compared to numbers two and three. So it appears that the line of the CEJ is likely right about the same as the crown margin. If we draw our imaginary CEJ line, and then we draw our line following the contour of the alveolar crest, we can see that the line is not parallel. It's more exaggerated toward the mesial of number 31. Therefore, number 31, has vertical bone loss on the mesial. Now, is it possible, do you think, to have both vertical and horizontal bone loss on the same tooth? Let's look back at the first picture and reevaluate number 29. Do you think that the mesial of 29 has horizontal or vertical bone loss? Take a minute to think about your answer. If you concluded that the tooth can have both horizontal and vertical bone loss, you would be correct. There are four choices when evaluating bone loss. We can have no bone loss, horizontal bone loss, vertical bone loss, or both horizontal and vertical bone loss. So it's important to look at the tooth on the mesial and on the distal when you're evaluating bone loss. When evaluating the height of the crestal bone, the best x-rays to use would be bite wings. The angle of a PA can distort the positioning of the crestal bone. While panoramics can show bone loss, they are not the best or the clearest image to evaluate intricate changes in the periodontium. Therefore, we always use bite wings for evaluating posterior alveolar bone height. Often we can image the interproximal bone just fine with a horizontal bite wing. However, if the patient has more than five millimeters of bone loss, we may need to take vertical bite wing films. The disadvantage to using vertical bite wings is that they are more uncomfortable for the patient and we cannot image the same amount of teeth in one film as we would with a horizontal bite wing. However, in patients with periodontal disease, vertical bite wings are often necessary in order to properly evaluate the, the alveolar bone height. The appearance of the PDL space is also an indicator of periodontal health. In this first x-ray, we can see clearly that the PDL is widened around the entire apex of this tooth. Remember that the PDLs are what attach the tooth to the lamina dura. So when this space is widened on x-ray all the way around the apex, we can assume that the tooth will likely have some mobility, though we wouldn't be able to verify that unless we were able to see clinically. If we examine this tooth further, we can see that the patient has lost all of the molar teeth on the upper left, and there's probably been some shifting of the remaining teeth. This may have led the patient to chew more anteriorly, putting extra pressure on this tooth, or the patient's bite may be misaligned, which also puts excess, excessive pressure on this tooth. In an already vulnerable periodontium, this excessive pressure can exacerbate and exaggerate the periodontal condition. In this second picture, we can see widening of the PDL space caused by bone resorption on either the mesial or distal of the intercrestal bone. This is what we call funneling. 
Furcation is not going to be seen on a ready raft until the bone resorption extends past the furcation area because we cannot evaluate the facial and lingual aspects of the ready raft. One thing to note with furcation involvement is that it is often greater than it appears on the radiograph. So once we see furcation on the radiograph, it's probably worse clinically than what we're seeing. The X-ray beam alignment could conceal the presence or extent of the involvement. Once we identify that there is furcation involvement, a furcation probe is gonna be necessary in determining the actual clinical involvement. So here we have a case of peri-implantitis. Peri-implantitis is an oral inflammatory process that affects the soft and hard tissue around an osseointegrated implant. I'm not going to go in depth on this one because we'll have an entire chapter dedicated just to peri-implantitis, but it's important to recognize that the signs of peri-implantitis are often first identified through radiograph. The crown to tooth ratio is something we need to mention as well. Evaluating the length of the crown to root ratio can also give us important information about the patient's risk of tooth loss with periodontitis. For example, here in the second picture, you can see that the patient's roots are severely blunted due to rapid ortho movement. This puts the patient at a much higher risk of tooth loss should they develop alveolar bone loss due to periodontitis. The ideal ratio of a crown to the roots is one to two, so the roots should be twice as long as the length of the crown. This is demonstrated in the first radiograph seen here. Other things we look for when assessing peridol issues would be things that increase risk, like calculus deposits. Remember that subgingival calculus does not cause periodontitis. It acts as an irritant and harbors the biofilm that causes disease. So when we see large calculus deposits on x-rays, sometimes that's associated with active periodontitis. Faulty restorations also increase the risk of periodontitis because they can act as an irritant and harbor bacteria. Here we can see a very large overhanging margin, which will act as a trap for biofilm. And here we can see a faulty contour on this filling. There's an open contact between number 14 and number 15, which increases the risk of food impaction and subsequent inflammation and biofilm accumulation. So what do radiographs not tell us? Well, many things actually. Just because there is alveolar bone loss on an x-ray does not mean that a patient has a deep periodontal pocket. X-rays do not tell us whether the gingiva is enlarged or recessed, whether it's erythemous or edematous. Therefore, we're unable to determine the health of gingival tissues with radiographs. We cannot see if periodontal disease is active or if the destruction happened 10 years ago. We need a series of radiographs over time along with a clinical assessment to assess changes. We do not have precision with radiographs. Radiographs are two-dimensional and teeth are three-dimensional. So while we can assess early changes in the alveolar crystal bone, that only shows us the interproximal space. We cannot actually evaluate the facial and lingual aspects in radiography, unless we're using some kind of 3D scanner like a CT scanner. Similarly, we cannot detect early furcation on radiographs because they are only two-dimensional. So hopefully this lecture has helped you understand how radiographs play an important role in assessment of the periodontia. See you next time.